Dr. Dre, Andre Rommel Young, born February 18, 1965, better known by his stage name Dr. Dre, is an American record producer, rapper and entrepreneur. He is the founder and CEO of Aftermath Entertainment and Beats Electronics, and was previously co-owner of Death Row Records. He has produced albums for and overseen the careers of many rappers, including Tupac, The DOC, Snoop Dogg, Eminem, Exhibit, Nocturnal, 50 Cent, The Game, and Kendrick Lamar. He is credited as a key figure in the crafting and popularization of West Coast G-Funk, a rap style characterized as synthesizer based with slow, heavy beats. He is the third richest figure in hip-hop, with a net worth of $770 million. Dre began his career as a member of the world-class Reckon Crew. He found fame with the influential gangsta rap group NWA with Easy e Ice Cube, MC Ren, and DJ Yella which popularized explicit lyrics in rap to detail the violence of street life. His 1992 solo debut The Chronic, released under Death Row Records, made him one of the best-selling American performing artists of 1993, and earned him a Grammy Award for the single Let Me Ride. That year, he produced Death Row label made Snoop Dogg's quadruple platinum debut Doggy Style, and mentored producers such as his stepbrother Warren G, leading to the multi-platinum debut Regulate, G-Funk era in 1994 and Snoop Dogg's cousin Daz Dillinger, leading to the double platinum debut Dog Food by the Dog Pound in 1995. In 1996, Dr. Dre left Death Row Records to establish his own label, Aftermath Entertainment. He produced a compilation album, Dr. Dre Presents the Aftermath, in 1996, and released a solo album, 2001, in 1999. During the 2000s, Dr. Dre focused on producing other artists, occasionally contributing vocals. Dr. Dre signed Eminem in 1998 and 50 Cent in 2002, and co-produced their albums. He has won six Grammy Awards, including Producer of the Year. Dr. Dre has had acting roles in movies such as Set It Off, The Wash and Training Day. Rolling Stone ranked Dre 56 on their list of 100 greatest artists of all time. Young was born in Compton, California the first child of Theodore and Verna Young. His middle name, Rommel, is derived from his father's amateur R&B singing group, the Rommels. His parents married in 1964, separated in 1968, and divorced in 1972. His mother later remarried to Curtis Crayon and had three children sons Jerome and Tyree, both deceased, and daughter Shamika. In 1976, Young began attending Vanguard Junior High School in Compton, but due to gang violence, he transferred to the safer suburban Roosevelt Junior High School. He lived a few years in Carson during his middle school years. Young has stated that he was mostly raised by his grandmother in New Wilmington Arms Housing Project in Compton. His mother later married Warren Griffin, whom she met at her new job in Long Beach, which added three stepsisters and one stepbrother to the family. His stepbrother would eventually become rapper Warren G. Young is the cousin of producer Sir Jinx. He attended Centennial High School in Compton during his freshman year in 1979, but transferred to Fremont High School in South Central Los Angeles due to poor grades. Young attempted to enroll in an apprenticeship program at Northrop Aviation Company, but poor grades at school made him ineligible. Thereafter, he focused on his social life and entertainment for the remainder of his high school years. Young fathered a son with Cassandra Joy Green named Curtis, born December 15, 1981. Curtis was brought up by his mother and first met his father 20 years later, when Curtis became rapper Hood Surgeon. Inspired by the Grandmaster Flash song The Adventures of Grandmaster Flash on the Wheels of Steel, he often attended a club called Eve After Dark to watch many DJs and rappers performing live. He subsequently became a DJ in the club, initially under the name Dr. J, based on the nickname of Julius Irving, his favorite basketball player. At the club, he met aspiring rapper Antoine Caraby later to become member DJ Yellow of NWA soon afterwards he adopted the moniker Dr. Dre, a mix of previous alias Dr. J and his first name, referring to himself as the master of mixology. Eve After Dark had a back room with a small four-track studio. In this studio, Dre and Yellow recorded several demos. In their first recording session, they recorded a song entitled Surgery with the lyrics calling Dr. Dre to surgery serving as the chorus to the song. He later joined the musical group World Class Wrecking Crew under the independent Crew Cut Records in 1984. The group would become stars of the electro-hop scene that dominated early 1980s West Coast hip-hop. Surgery, which was officially released after being recorded prior to the group's official formation, 
would prominently feature Dr. Dre on the turntable. The record would become the group's first hit, selling 50,000 copies within the Compton area. Dr. Dre and DJ Yella also performed mixes for local radio station KDAY, boosting ratings for its afternoon rush hour show The Traffic Jam. Dr. Dre's earliest recordings were released in 1994 on a compilation titled Concrete Roots. Stephen Thomas Early Wine of the website All Music described the compiled music, released several years before Dre developed a distinctive style, as surprisingly generic and unengaging and for dedicated fans only. His frequent absences from school jeopardized his position as a diver on his school swim team. After high school, he attended Chester Adult School in Compton following his mother's demands for him to get a job or continue his education. After brief attendance at a radio broadcasting school, he relocated to the residence of his father and residence of his grandparents before returning to his mother's house. He later dropped out of Chester to focus on performing at the Eves After Dark nightclub. In 1986, Dr. Dre met rapper O'Shea Jackson, nicknamed Ice Cube, who collaborated with Dr. Dre to record songs for Ruthless Records, a rap record label run by local rapper Eze. NWA and fellow West Coast rapper Ice D are widely credited as seminal artists of the gangsta rap genre, a profanity-heavy subgenre of hip-hop, replete with gritty depictions of urban crime and gang lifestyle. Not feeling constricted to racially charged political issues pioneered by rap artists such as Public Enemy or Boogie Down Productions, NWA favored themes and uncompromising lyrics, offering stark descriptions of violent, inner-city streets. Propelled by the hit Fuck the Police, the group's first full album Straight Outta Compton became a major success, despite an almost complete absence of radio airplay or major concert tours. The Federal Bureau of Investigation sent Ruthless Records a warning letter in response to the song's content. After Ice Cube left NWA in 1989 over financial disputes, Dr. Dre produced and performed for much of the group's second album A Feel For Zagan. He also produced tracks for a number of other acts on Ruthless Records, including Easy es 1988 solo debut Easy Does It, Above the Law's 1990 debut Live In Like Hustlers, Michelle's 1989 self-titled debut. The DOC's 1989 debut No One Can Do It Better, JJ Fad's 1988 debut Supersonic and Funk Rock Musician Jimmy Z's 1991 album Musical Madness. After a dispute with Easy e Dre left the group at the peak of its popularity in 1991 under the advice of friend, and NWA lyricist, the DOC and his bodyguard at the time, Suge Knight. Knight, a notorious strongman and intimidator, was able to have Easy e release Young from his contract and, using Dr. Dre as his flagship artist, founded Death Row Records. In 1992 Young released his first single, the title track to the film Deep Cover, a collaboration with rapper Snoop Dogg, whom he met through Warren G. Dr. Dre's debut solo album was The Chronic, released under Death Row Records with Suge Knight as executive producer. Young ushered in a new style of rap, both in terms of musical style and lyrical content, including introducing a number of artists to the industry including Snoop Dogg, Corrupt, Daz Dillinger, RBX, The Lady of Rage, Nate Dogg, and Jewel. On the strength of singles such as Nothing But a G Thang, Let Me Ride, and Fuck With Dre Day, and Everybody's Celebrating, known as Dre Day for radio and television play, all of which featured Snoop Dogg as guest vocalist, The Chronic became a cultural phenomenon, its G-Funk sound dominating much of hip-hop music for the early 1990s. In 1993 the Recording Industry Association of America, RIAA, certified the album Triple Platinum, and Dr. Dre also won a Grammy Award for Best Rap Solo Performance for his performance on Let Me Ride. For that year, Billboard magazine also ranked Dr. Dre as the eighth best-selling musical artist, The Chronic as the sixth best-selling album, and Nothing But a G Thang as the eleventh best-selling single. Besides working on his own material, Dr. Dre produced Snoop Dogg's debut album Doggy Style which became the first debut album for an artist to enter Billboard 200 album charts at number one. In 1994 Dr. Dre produced some songs on the soundtracks to the films Above the Rim and Murder was the case. He collaborated with fellow NWA member Ice Cube for the song Natural Born Killers in 1995. For the film Friday, Dre recorded Keep Their Heads Ringing, which reached number 10 on the Billboard Hot 100 and number one on the Hot Rap Singles, now Hot Rap Tracks, charts. In 1995, Death Row Records signed rapper Tupac, 
and began to position him as their major star. He collaborated with Dr. Dre on the commercially successful single California Love, which became both artists' first song to top the Billboard Hot 100. However, in March 1996, Young left the label amidst a contract dispute and growing concerns that label boss Suge Knight was corrupt, financially dishonest, and out of control. Later that year, he formed his own label, Aftermath Entertainment, under the distribution label for Death Row Records, Interscope Records. Subsequently, Death Row Records suffered poor sales by 1997, especially following the death of Tupac and the racketeering charges brought against Knight. Dr. Dre also appeared on the single No Diggity by R&B group Blackstreet in 1996, it too was a sales success, topping the Hot 100 for four consecutive weeks, and later won the award for Best R&B Vocal by a Duo or Group at the 1997 Grammy Awards. After hearing it for the first time, Several of Dr. Dre's former Death Row colleagues, including Tupac, recorded and attempted to release a song titled Toss It Up, containing numerous insults aimed at Dr. Dre and using a deliberately similar instrumental to No Diggity, but were forced to replace the production after Blackstreet issued the label with a cease and desist order stopping them from distributing the song. The Dr. Dre Presents the Aftermath album, released on November 26, 1996, featured songs by Dr. Dre himself as well as by newly signed Aftermath Entertainment artists, and a solo track been there, done that, intended as a symbolic farewell to gangster rap. Despite being classified platinum by the RIAA, the album was not very popular among music fans. In October 1996, Dre performed Been There, Done That on Saturday Night Live. In 1997, Dr. Dre produced several tracks on the firm's The Album, it was met with largely negative reviews from critics. Rumors began to abound that Aftermath was facing financial difficulties. Aftermath Entertainment also faced a trademark infringement lawsuit by the underground thrash metal band Aftermath. First Round Knockout, a compilation of various tracks produced and performed by Dr. Dre, was also released in 1996, with material ranging from world class wrecking crew to NWA to death row recordings. Dr. Dre chose to take no part in the ongoing East Coast West Coast hip hop rivalry of the time, instead, producing for, and appearing on, several New York artists' releases, such as Nas Nas is Coming, LL Cool J Zoom, and Jay Z's Watch Me. The turning point for Aftermath came in 1998, when Jimmy Iovini, the head of Aftermath's parent label Interscope, suggested that Dr. Dre sign Eminem a white rapper from Detroit. Dre produced three songs and provided vocals for two on Eminem's successful and controversial debut album The Slim Shady LP, released in 1999. The Dr. Dre produced lead single from that album, My Name Is, brought Eminem to public attention for the first time, and the success of The Slim Shady LP, it reached number two on the Billboard 200 and received general acclaim from critics, revived the label's commercial ambitions and viability. Dr. Dre's second solo album, 2001, released on November 16, 1999, was considered an ostentatious return to his gangster rap roots. It was initially titled The Chronic 2000 to imply being a sequel to his debut solo effort The Chronic but was retitled 2001 after Death Row Records released an unrelated compilation album with the title in May 1999. Other tentative titles included The Chronic 2001 and Dr. Dre. The album featured numerous collaborators, including Devin the Dude, Snoop Dogg, Corrupt, Exhibit, Nate Dogg, Eminem, Nocturnal, King T, Defari, Cocaine, Mary J. Blige and new protege Hitman, as well as co-production between Dre and new Aftermath producer Mel Mandot Stephen Thomas Early Wine of the website All Music described the sound of the album as adding ominous strings, soulful vocals, and reggae to Dr. Dre's style. The album was highly successful charting at number two on the Billboard 200 charts and has since been certified six times platinum, validating a recurring theme on the album, Dr. Dre was still a force to be reckoned with, despite the lack of major releases in the previous few years. The album included popular hit singles Still DRE and Forgot About Dre, both of which Dr. Dre performed on NBC's Saturday Night Live on October 23, 1999. Dr. Dre won the Grammy Award for Producer of the Year, non-classical in 2000 and joined the Up and Smoke tour with fellow rappers Eminem, Snoop Dogg, and Ice Cube that year as well. During the course of 2001's popularity, Dr. Dre was involved in several lawsuits. Lucasfilm Limited, the film company behind the Star Wars film franchise, sued him over the use of the THX trademark Deep Note. 
The Fatback Band also sued Dr. Dre over alleged infringement regarding its song Backstroking in his song Let's Get High from the 2001 album. Dr. Dre was ordered to pay $1.5 million to the band in 2003. French jazz musician Jacques Lussier sued Aftermath for $10 million in March 2002, claiming that the Dr. Dre produced Eminem track Kill You plagiarized his composition Pulsion. The online music file sharing company Napster also settled a lawsuit with him and metal band Metallica in the summer of 2001, agreeing to block access to certain files that artists do not want to have shared on the network. Following the success of 2001, Dr. Dre focused on producing songs and albums for other artists. He co-produced six tracks on Eminem's landmark Marshall Mathers LP, including the Grammy-winning lead single, The Real Slim Shady. The album itself earned a Grammy and proved to be the fastest-selling rap album of all time, moving 1.76 million units in its first week alone. He produced the single Family Affair by R&B singer Mary J. Blige for her album No More Drama in 2001. He also produced Let Me Blow Your Mind, a duet by rapper Eve and No Doubt lead singer Gwen Stefani and signed her and B singer Truth Hurts to Aftermath in 2001. Dr. Dre was the executive producer of Eminem's 2002 release, The Eminem Show. He produced three songs on the album, one of which was released as a single, and he appeared in the award-winning video for Without Me. He also produced the DOC's 2003 album Deuce, where he made a guest appearance on the track's Psychic Pimp Hotline. Gorilla Pimpin' and Judgment Day. Another copyright-related lawsuit hit Dr. Dre in the fall of 2002, when Sariga Ma, a film and music company based in Calcutta, India, sued Aftermath Entertainment over an uncredited sample of the Lata Mangeshkar song Toda Risham Lag to High on the Aftermath-produced song Addictive by singer Truth Hurts. In February 2003, a judge ruled that Aftermath would have to halt sales of Truth Hurts' album Truthfully Speaking if the company would not credit Mangeshkar. Another successful album on the Aftermath label was Get Rich or Die Tryin', the 2003 major label debut album by Queens, New York-based rapper 50 Cent. Dr. Dre produced or co-produced four tracks on the album, including the hit single and a club, a joint production between Aftermath, Eminem's boutique label Shady Records and Interscope. Eminem's fourth album since joining Aftermath, Encore, again saw Dre taking on the role of executive producer, and this time he was more actively involved in the music producing or co-producing a total of eight tracks, including three singles. In November 2004, at the Vibe Magazine Awards show in Los Angeles, Dr. Dre was attacked by a fan named Jimmy James Johnson, who was supposedly asking for an autograph. In the resulting scuffle, then G-Unit rapper Young Buck stabbed the man. Johnson claimed that Suge Knight, president of Death Row Records, paid him $5,000 to assault Dre in order to humiliate him before he received his Lifetime Achievement Award. Knight immediately went on CBS's The Late Late Show to deny involvement and insisted that he supported Dr. Dre and wanted Johnson charged. In September 2005, Johnson was sentenced to a year in prison in order to stay away from Dr. Dre until 2008. Dr. Dre also produced How We Do, a 2005 hit single from rapper The Game from his album The Documentary, as well as tracks on 50 Cent's successful second album The Massacre. For an issue of Rolling Stone magazine in April 2005, Dr. Dre was ranked 54th out of 100 artists for Rolling Stone magazine's list The Immortals, the greatest artists of all time. Kanye West wrote the summary for Dr. Dre, where he stated Dr. Dre's song Explosive is where he got his whole sound from. In November 2006, Dr. Dre began working with Raekwon on his album Only Built for Cuban Links 2. He also produced tracks for the rap albums Buck the World by Young Buck, Curtis by 50 Cent, The Blue Carpet Treatment by Snoop Dogg, and Kingdom Come by Jay-Z. Dre also appeared on Timbaland's track Bounce, from his 2007 solo album, Timbaland Presents Shock Value alongside, Missy Elliott, and Justin Timberlake. During this period, the DOC stated that Dre had been working with him on his fourth album Voices Through Hot Vessels, which he planned to release after Detox arrived. Planned but unreleased albums during Dr. Dre's tenure at Aftermath have included a full-length reunion with Snoop Dogg titled Break Up to Make Up an album with fellow former N.W.A. member Ice Cube which was to be titled Hell to Skelta, an N.W.A. reunion album, and a joint album with fellow producer Timbaland titled Chairman of the Board. In 2007, Dr. Dre's third studio album, formerly known as Detox, was slated to be his final studio album. Work for the upcoming album dates back to 2001, where its first version was called the most advanced rap album ever, 
by producer Scott Stork. Later that same year, he decided to stop working on the album to focus on producing for other artists, but then changed his mind. The album had initially been set for a fall 2005 release. Producers confirmed to work on the album include DJ Khalil, Knotts, Bernard Focus Edwards Jr., High Tech, J.R. Rodham, RZA, Jay Z, Warren G., and Boy Wanda. Snoop Dogg claimed that Detox was finished, according to a June 2008 report by Rolling Stone magazine. After another delay based on producing other artists' work, Detox was then scheduled for a 2010 release, coming after 50 Cent's Before I Self Destruct and Eminem's Relapse, an album for which Dr. Dre handled the bulk of production duties. In a Dr. Pepper commercial that debuted on May 28, 2009, he premiered the first official snippet of Detox. 50 Cent and Eminem asserted in an interview on BET's 106 and Park that Dr. Dre had around a dozen songs finished for Detox. On December 15, 2008, Dre appeared in the remix of the song Set It Off by Canadian rapper Cardinal Official, also with Pusha T. The remix debuted on DJ Ski's radio show. At the beginning of 2009, Dre produced, and made a guest vocal performance on, the single Crack a Bottle by Eminem and the single saw a record 418,000 downloads in its first week and reached the top of the Billboard Hot 100 chart on the week of February 12, 2009. Along with this single, in 2009 Dr. Dre produced or co-produced 19 of 20 tracks on Eminem's album Relapse. These included other hit singles We Made You, Old Time's Sake, and 3AM. The only track Dre did not produce was the Eminem-produced single Beautiful, on April 20, 2010, Under Pressure. Featuring Jay Z and co produced with Scott Stork, was confirmed by Jimmy Eovini and Dr. Dre during an interview at Fenway Park as the album's first single. The song leaked prior to its intended release in an unmixed, unmastered form without a chorus on June 16, 2010. However, critical reaction to the song was lukewarm, and Dr. Dre later announced in an interview that the song, along with any other previously leaked tracks from Detox's recording process, would not appear on the final version of the album. Two genuine singles, Kush, a collaboration with Snoop Dogg and fellow rapper Akon, and I Need a Doctor with Eminem and singer Skylar Grey, were released in the United States during November 2010 and February 2011 respectively, the latter achieved international chart success, reaching number 4 on the Billboard Hot 100 and later being certified double platinum by the RIAA and the Australian Recording Industry Association, ARIA. On June 25, 2010, the American Society of Composers, Authors and Publishers honored Dr. Dre with its Founders Award for inspiring other musicians. In an August 2010 interview, Dr. Dre stated that an instrumental album titled The Planets is in its first stages of production, each song being named of Terra Planet in the Solar System. On September 3, Dr. Dre showed support to longtime protege Eminem, and appeared on his and Jay Z's Home and Home Tour, performing hit songs such as Still DRE, Nothing But a G Thang and Crack a Bottle, alongside Eminem and another protege, 50 Cent. Sporting an R.I.P. proof shirt, Dre was honored by Eminem telling Detroit's Comerica Park to do the same. They did so, by chanting Detox, to which he replied, I'm coming. On November 14, 2011, Dre announced that he would be taking a break from music after he finished producing for artists Slim the Mobster and Kendrick Lamar. In this break, he stated that he would work on bringing his beats by Dre to a standard as high as Apple and would also spend time with his family. On January 9, 2012, Dre headlined the final nights of the 2012 Coachella Valley Music and Arts Festival, on the weekends of April 13-15 and April 20-22, 2012. In a June 2014 interview with Wrap Up, Marsha Ambrosius talked about working on Dr. Dre's third album. She stated that she had gone to Hawaii before the end of 2013 for a few weeks to work with him on so many things including his upcoming album and a project of her own among other unspecified projects. Ambrosius also told Rap Up that Dr. Dre's third album is no longer called Detox, but didn't reveal the new title. In a September interview with Shots Fired Tat same year, Aftermath Entertainment in-house producer Da Juan Parker confirmed the title change. Parker also refrained from revealing the new title because of the fact that the title hadn't been leaked online. He also told Shots Fired that there are as many as 300 beats that have been created for the album over the years, but few of them have had vocals recorded over them. The length of time that Detox had been recorded for, as well as the limited amount of material that had been officially released or leaked from the recording sessions, had given it considerable notoriety within the music industry. 
numerous release dates, including the ones mentioned above, had been given for the album over the years since it was first announced, although none of them transpired to be genuine. Several musicians closely affiliated with Dr. Dre, including Snoop Dogg, fellow rappers 50 Cent, the game and producer DJ Quick, had speculated in interviews that the album will never be released, due to Dr. Dre's business and entrepreneurial ventures having interfered with recording work, as well as causing him to lose motivation to record new material. On his Beats One radio show The Pharmacy on August 1, 2015, Dre announced that he would release what would be his final album, titled Compton. It is inspired by the NWA biopic Straight Outta Compton and is a compilation-style album, featuring a number of frequent collaborators, including Eminem, Snoop Dogg, Kendrick Lamar, Exhibit, and The Game, among others. It was released exclusively for iTunes and Apple Music on August 7. A physical version was published on August 21. In an interview with Rolling Stone, he revealed that he had about 20 to 40 tracks for Detox but he didn't release it because it didn't meet his standards and he thought he was done being an artist. He also revealed that he suffers from social anxiety and due to this remains secluded and out of attention. On February 12, 2016, it was revealed that Apple would create its first original scripted television series and it would star Dr. Dot Dre. Called Vital Signs, it is set to reflect the life of Dr. Dre. Dr. Dre will additionally be an executive producer on the show. In October 2016, Puff Daddy brought out Dr. Dre, Snoop Dogg and others on his Bad Boy reunion tour. Dr. Dre made his first on-screen appearance as a weapons dealer in the 1996 bank robbery movie Set It Off. In 2001, Dr. Dre also appeared in the movies The Wash and Training Day. A song of his, Bad Intentions, featuring Nocturnal, and produced by Mahogany, was featured on the Wash soundtrack. Dr. Dre also appeared on two other songs on the boulevard and the wash along with his co-star Snoop Dogg. In February 2007 it was announced that Dr. Dre would produce dark comedies and horror films for New Line Cinema-owned company Crucial Films, along with longtime video director Philip Atwell. Dr. Dre announced this is a natural switch for me, since I've directed a lot of music videos, and I eventually want to get into directing. Along with fellow member Ice Cube, Dr. Dre produced Straight Outta Compton, 2015, a biographical film about N.W.A. In July 2008, Dr. Dre released his first brand of headphones, Beats by Dr. Dre. The line consisted of Beats Studio, a circumoral headphone, Beats Tour, and an ear headphone, Beats Solo and Solo HD, a supra oral headphone, Beats Spin, Heartbeats by Lady Gaga, also an in ear headphone, and Diddy Beats. In autumn 2009, Hewlett Packard participated in a deal to bundle Beats by Dr. Dre with some HP laptops and headsets. HP and Dr. Dre announced the deal on October 9, 2009, at a press event in Santa Monica, California. An exclusive laptop, known as the HP NV15 Beats Limited Edition, was released for sale October 22. In May 2014, technology giant Apple purchased the Beats brand for $3 billion, Apple's most expensive purchase by fur. The deal made Dr. Dre the richest man in hip-hop, surpassing Diddy. During May 2013, Dr. Dre and Jimmy Iovini donated a $70 million endowment to the University of Southern California to create the USC Jimmy Iovini and Andre Young Academy for Arts, Technology and the Business of Innovation. The goal of the Academy has been stated as to shape the future by nurturing the talents, passions, leadership and risk-taking of uniquely qualified students who are motivated to explore and create new art forms technologies, and business models. The first class of the Academy began in September 2014. In June 2017, it was announced that Dr. Dre has committed $10 million to the construction of a performing arts center for the new Compton High School. The center will encompass creative resources and a 1,200-seat theater, and is expected to break ground in 2020. The project is a partnership between Dr. Dre and the Compton Unified School District. An urban legend surfaced in 2011 when a Tumblr blog titled Dr. Dre Started Burning Man began proliferating the notion that the producer, rapper and entrepreneur had discovered Burning Man in 1995 during a music video shoot and offered to cover the cost of the event's permit from the Nevada Bureau of Land Management under an agreement with the festival's organizers that he could institute an entrance fee system, which had not existed before his participation. This claim was supported by an alleged letter from Dre to Nicole Threat Young that indicated that Dre had shared his experience witnessing the Burning Man Festival with her. 
Business Insider mentions the portion of the letter where Dr. Dre purportedly states someone should get behind this and make some money off these fools and compares Dr. Dre's potential entrepreneurial engagement with Burning Man as a parallel to Steve Jobs' efforts to centralize and profit from the otherwise unorganized online music industry. According to Salon, Dr. Dre's ethos seems to be aligned with seven of the ten principles of the Burning Man community, radical self-reliance, radical self-expression, communal effort, civic responsibility, leaving no trace, participation and immediacy. Dr. Dre is renowned for constantly evolving his production style through the years, while always keeping in touch with his roots and reshaping elements from previous work. In the start of his career as a producer for the world-class wrecking crew with DJ Alonzo Williams in the mid-1980s, his beats were in the electro-hop style pioneered by the unknown DJ, and that of early hip-hop groups like the Beastie Boys and Houdini. These influences are evident in Easy es 1986 song Boys and the Hood, which Dre produced. Sampling was at the time a key element of Dre's production, the EMU SP-1200 being his primary instrument in then. Days. In 1987, Dr. Dre sampled the Ohio Players ARP synth riffs from their 1973 funk hit Funky Worm in the NWA song Dope Man. Being the first hip-hop producer to sample the song, Dre both paved the way for the future popularization of the G-Funk style within hip-hop and established heavy synthesizer solos as an integral part of his production style. Dr. Dre was also one of the very first producers to interpolate the then-little-known drum break from the Winston's Amen, brother in the NWA song Straight Outta Compton. This break has since become a crown me a staple in not only hip-hop, but all popular music, having been used in over 1,700 songs. From Straight Outta Compton on, Dre uses live musicians to replay old melodies rather than sampling them. With Ruthless Records, collaborators included guitarist Mike Crazy Neck Sims, multi-instrumentalist Colin Wolfe, DJ Yella and sound engineer Donovan the Dirt Biker Sound. Dre is receptive of new ideas from other producers, one example being his fruitful collaboration with Above the Laws producer Cold 187 Micrometers while at Ruthless. Cold 187 Micrometers was at the time experimenting with 1970s P-Funk samples, Parliament, Funkadelic, Bootsy Collins. George Clinton etc., that Dre also utilized. Dre has since been accused of stealing the concept of G-Funk from cold 187 micrometers. Upon leaving Ruthless and forming Death Row Records in 1991, Dre called on veteran West Coast DJ Chris the Glove Taylor and sound engineer Greg Gregsky Royal, along with Colin Wolfe, to help him on future projects. His 1992 album The Chronic is thought to be one of the most well-produced hip-hop albums of all time. Musical themes included hard-hitting synthesizer solos played by Wolf, bass-heavy compositions, background female vocals and Dre fully embracing 1970s funk samples. Dre used a mini-moog synth to replay the melody from Leon Haywood's 1972 song I Wanna Do Something Freaky to You for the Chronic's first single Nothing But a G-Thang which became a global hit. For his new protege Snoop Doggy Dogg's album Doggy Style, Dre collaborated with then 19-year-old producer Daz Dillinger who received co-production credits on songs Serial Killer and For All My Niggas and Bitches, the dramatic space player Tony T. Money Green, guitarist Ricky Rouse, keyboardists Emmanuel Porkchop Dean and Sean Barney Rubble Thomas and engineer Tommy Dougherty, as well as Warren G. and Sam Sneed, who are credited with bringing several samples to the studio. The influence of the chronic and doggy style on the popular music of the 1990s went not only far beyond the West Coast, but beyond hip-hop as a genre. Artists as diverse as Master P, Bout It, Bout It, George Michael, Fast Love, Mariah Carey, Fantasy, Luis Miguel, Dame, and the Spice Girls, Say You'll Be There, used G-Funk instrumentation in their songs. Bad Boy Records producer Chucky Thompson stated in the April 2004 issue of Double XL magazine that the sound of Doggy Style and the Chronic was the basis for the notorious B.I.G.'s 1995 hit single Big Papa. In 1994, starting with The Murder Was the Case soundtrack, Dre attempted to push the boundaries of G-Funk further into a darker sound. In songs such as Murder Was the Case and Natural Born Killers, the synthesizer pitch is higher and the drum tempo is slowed down to 91 BPM. 87 BPM in 3 mix, to create a dark and gritty atmosphere. Percussion instruments, particularly sleigh bells, are also present. Dre's frequent collaborators from this period included Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania native Stuart Stubby Dubillard, a multi instrumentalist from the Ozanam Strings Orchestra, Sam Sneed, Stephen Budda Anderson, 
and percussionist Carl Butch Small. This style of production has been influential far beyond the West Coast. The beat for the Houston-based group Ghetto Boys' 1996 song still follows the same drum pattern as Natural Born Killers and Easy Ease What Would You Do, a distant ray, is similar to the original Murder Was the Case instrumental. This style of production is usually accompanied by horror and occult themed lyrics and imagery, being crucial to the creation of horrorcore. By 1996, Dre was again looking to innovate his sound. He recruited keyboardist Conra Cambone to play the keys on Been There, Done That, and through Butta and Sam Sneedy was introduced to fellow Pittsburgh native Melvin Melman Bradford. At this time, he also switched from using the MUSP-1200 to the Akai MPC-3000 drum kit and sampler, which he still uses today. Beginning with his 1996 compilation Drive. Dre presents the aftermath, Dre's production has taken a less sample-based approach, with loud, layered snare drums dominating the mix, while synthesizers are still omnipresent. In his critically acclaimed second album, 2001, Live Instrumentation takes the place of sampling, a famous example being the next episode, in which keyboardist Conrad Cambone replayed Live the main melody from David McCallum's 1967 jazz funk work The Edge. For every song on 2001, Dre had a keyboardist, guitarist and bassist create the basic parts of the beat, while he himself programmed the drums, did the sequencing and overdubbing and added sound effects, and later mixed the songs. During this period, Dre's signature West Coast whistle riffs are still present albeit in a lower pitch, as in Light Speed, Housewife, Some LA Niggas and Eminem's Guilty Conscience hooked up the sound of 2001 had tremendous influence on hip-hop production, redefining the West Coast sound and expanding the G-Funk of the early 1990s. To produce the album, Dre and Melman relied on the talents of Scott Stork and Kamara Cambone on the keys, Mike Elisondo and Colin Wolfe on bass guitar. Sean Cruz on lead guitar and sound engineers Richard Siegel Haridia and Mauricio Vito Arigori. From the mid-2000s, Dr. Dre has taken on a more soulful production style, using more of a classical piano instead of a keyboard, and having claps replace snares, as evidenced in songs such as Snoop Dogg's Imagine and Boss Life, Busta Rhymes Get You Some and Been Through the Storm, Stat Quo's Get Low and The Way It Be, Jay-Z's Lost One, Nods Hustlers, and several beats on Eminem's Relapse album. Soul and R&B pianist Mark Batson, having previously worked with the Dave Matthews Band, Seal and Maroon 5 has been credited as the architect of this sound. Besides Batson, Aftermath producer and understudy of Dre's, Dot One Parker, who has named Q-Tip and Jay Dilla as his primary influences, is thought to be responsible for giving Dre's newest beats an East Coast feel. Dr. Dre has said that his primary instrument in the studio is the Akai MPC-3000, a drum machine and sampler, and that he often uses as many as four or five to produce a single recording. He cites 1970s funk musicians such as George Clinton, Isaac Hayes and Curtis Mayfield as his primary musical influences. Unlike most rap producers, he tries to avoid samples as much as possible, preferring to have studio musicians replay pieces of music he wants to use because it allows him more flexibility to change the pieces in rhythm and tempo. In 2001 he told Time magazine, I may hear something I like on an old record that may inspire me, but I'd rather use musicians to recreate the sound or elaborate on it. I can control it better. Other equipment he uses includes the EMUSP 1200 drum machine and other keyboards from such manufacturers as Korg, Rhodes, Wurlitzer. Moak, and Roland. Dr. Dre also stresses the importance of equalizing drums properly, telling Scratch magazine in 2004 that he used the same drum sounds on a couple of different songs on one album before but you'd never be able to tell the difference because of the EQ. Dr. Dre also uses the Digital Audio Workstation Pro Tools and uses the software to combine hardware drum machines and vintage analog keyboards and synthesizers. After founding Aftermath Entertainment in 1996, Dr. Dre took on producer Mel Mann as a co-producer, and his music took on a more synthesizer-based sound, using fewer vocal samples, as he had used on Lil Ghetto Boy and Let Me Write on the Chronic, for example. Mel Mann has not shared co-production credits with Dr. Dre since approximately 2002, but fellow Aftermath producer Focus has credited Mel Mann as a key architect of the signature Aftermath sound. In 1999, Dr. Dre started working with Mike Elizondo, a bassist, guitarist, and keyboardist who has also produced, written and played on records for female singers such as Poe, Fiona Apple, and Alanis Morissette. In the past few years Elizondo has since worked for many of Dr. Dre's productions. 
Dr. Dre also told Scratch Magazine in a 2004 interview that he has been studying piano and music theory formally, and that a major goal is to accumulate enough musical theory to score movies. In the same interview he stated that he has collaborated with famed 1960s songwriter Burt Bacharach by sending him hip-hop beats to play over, and hopes to have an in-person collaboration with him in the future. Dr. Dre has stated that he is a perfectionist and is known to pressure the artists with whom he records to give flawless performances. In 2006, Snoop Dogg told the website Dubkin.com that Dr. Dre had made new artist Bishop Lamont re record a single bar of vocals 107 times. Dr. Dre has also stated that Eminem is a fellow perfectionist and attributes his success on Aftermath to his similar work ethic. He gives a lot of input into the delivery of the vocals and will stop an MC during a take if it is not to his liking. However, he gives MCs that he works with room to write lyrics without too much instruction unless it is a specifically conceptual record, as noted by Bishop Lamont in the book How to Rap. A consequence of his perfectionism is that some artists who initially signed deals with Dr. Dre's Aftermath label never release albums. In 2001, Aftermath released the soundtrack to the movie The Wash, featuring a number of Aftermath acts such as Shanta, Docs, Joe Beast, and Toy. To date, None have released full-length albums on Aftermath and have apparently ended their relationships with the label and Dr. Dre. Other noteworthy acts to leave Aftermath without releasing albums include King T, 2001 vocalist Hitman, Joel Ortiz, Rake One and Rakim. Over the years, word of other collaborators who have contributed to Dr. Dre's work has surfaced. During his tenure at Death Row Records, it was alleged that Dr. Dre's stepbrother Warren G. and the Dog Pound member Dawes made many uncredited contributions to songs on his solo album The Chronic and Snoop Doggy Dog's album Doggy Style. Dawes received production credits on Snoop's similar sounding, albeit less successful album The Dog Father after Young left Death Row Records. It is known that Scott Stork, who has since gone on to become a successful producer in his own right, contributed to Dr. Dre's second album 2001. Stork is credited as a songwriter on several songs and played keyboards on several tracks. In 2006, he told Rolling Stone. Current collaborator Mike Elisondo, when speaking about his work with Young, describes their recording process as a collaborative effort involving several musicians. In 2004, he claimed to Songwriter Universe magazine that he had written the foundations of the hit Eminem song The Real Slim Shady, stating, I initially played a bass line on the song, and Dr. Dre. Tommy Coster Jr. and I built the track from there. Eminem then heard the track, and he wrote the rap to it. This account is essentially confirmed by Eminem in his book Angry Blonde, stating that the tune for the song was composed by a studio bassist and keyboardist while Dr. Dre was out of the studio but Young later programmed the song's beat after returning. A group of disgruntled former associates of Dr. Dre complained that they had not received their full due for work on the label in the September 2003 issue of The Source. A producer named Nephew claimed to have produced the songs Say What You Say and My Dad's Gone Crazy on the Eminem Show, the songs If I Can't and Back Down on 50 Cents Get Rich or Die Tryin', and the beat featured on Dr. Dre's commercial for Coors Beer. Although Young studies piano and musical theory, he serves as more of a conductor than a musician himself, as Josh Tierengel of Time magazine has noted. Although Snoop Dogg retains working relationships with Warren G and Dawes, who are alleged to be uncredited contributors on the hit albums The Chronic and Doggy Style, he states that Dr. Dre is capable of making beats without the help of collaborators, and that he is responsible for the success of his numerous albums. Dr. Dre's prominent studio collaborators, including Scott Stork, Ellie Sondo, Mark Batson, and Dot One Parker, have shared co-writing, instrumental, and more recently co-production credits on the songs where he is credited as the producer. Anderson Pock also praised Dr. Dre in a 2016 interview with Music Times, telling the publication that it was a dream come true to work with Dre. It is acknowledged that most of Dr. Dre's raps are written for him by others, though he retains ultimate control over his lyrics and the themes of his songs. As Aftermath producer Mahogany told Scratch, it's like a classroom in the booth. He'll have three writers in there. They'll bring in something, he'll recite it, then he'll say, change this line, change this word like he's grading papers. As seen in the credits for tracks Young has appeared on, there are often multiple people who contribute to his songs, although often in hip-hop many people are officially credited as a writer for a song, even the producer. In the book How to Rap, RBX explains that writing the chronic was a team effort and details how he ghostwrote Let Me Ride for Dre. In regard to ghostwriting lyrics he says, 
Dre doesn't profess to be no super duper rap dude, Dre is a super duper producer. As a member of NWE, the DOC wrote lyrics for him while he stuck with producing. New York City rapper Jay-Z Ghost wrote lyrics for the single Still D.R.E. from Dr. Dre's album 2001. Dr. Dre has had four sons and two daughters, by five different women. Dr. Dre has been accused of violence against women in the past. On January 27, 1991, at a music industry party at the Ponana Souk Club in Hollywood, Dr. Dre assaulted television host Dee Barnes of the Fox television program Pump It Up because he felt dissatisfied with her news report about the feud between the remaining NWA members and Ice Cube. Barnes filed a $22.7 million lawsuit in response to the incident. Subsequently, Dr. Dre was fined $2,500, given two years probation, ordered to undergo 240 hours of community service, and given a spot on an anti-violence public service announcement on television. The civil suit was settled out of court. Barnes stated that Young began slamming her face and the right side of her body repeatedly against a wall near the stairway. Dr. Dre later commented people talk all this shit, but you know, somebody fucks with me, I'm gonna fuck with them. I just did it, you know. Ain't nothing you can do now by talking about it. Besides, it ain't no big thing, I just threw her through a door. In March 2015, Singer Michelle accused him of physical abuse during their time together as a couple but did not initiate legal action. Former label mate Terry B. also claimed that Dre assaulted her at a post-Grammy party in 1990, in response to her track Ruthless Bitch. During press for the 2015 film Straight Outta Compton, questions about the portrayal and behavior of Dr. Dre and other prominent figures in the rap community about violence against women, and the question about its absence in the film, were raised. The discussion about the film led to Dr. Dre addressing his past behavior in the press. In August 2015, in an interview with Rolling Stone, Dre lamented his abusive past, saying, I made some fucking horrible mistakes in my life. I was young, fucking stupid. I would say all the allegations aren't true, some of them are. Those are some of the things that I would like to take back. It was really fucked up. But I paid for those mistakes, and there's no way in hell that I will ever make another mistake like that again. In a statement to the New York Times on August 21, 2015, Dre again addressed his abusive past, stating, 25 years ago I was a young man drinking too much and in over my head with no real structure in my life. However, none of this is an excuse for what I did. I've been married for 19 years and every day I'm working to be a better man for my family, seeking guidance along the way. I'm doing everything I can so I never resemble that man again. He went on to apologize to all the women he abused, saying, I apologize to the women I've hurt. I deeply regret what I did and know that it has forever impacted all of our lives. Dr. Dre pleaded guilty in October 1992 in a case of battery of a police officer and was convicted on two additional battery counts stemming from a brawl in the lobby of the New Orleans Hotel in May 1991. On January 10, 1994, Dr. Dre was arrested after leading police on a 90 miles per hour pursuit through Beverly Hills in his 1987 Ferrari. It was revealed Dr. Dre had a blood alcohol of 0.16 twice the state's legal limit. The conviction violated Dre's battery conviction in 1991 and he was sentenced to eight months in prison in September 1994. In 2001, Dr. Dre earned a total of about 52 million U.S. dollars from selling part of his share of Aftermath Entertainment to Interscope Records and his production off such hit songs that year as Family Affair by Mary J. Blige. Rolling Stone magazine thus named him the second highest paid artist of the year. Dr. Dre was ranked 44th in 2004 from earnings of $11.4 million, primarily from production royalties from such projects as albums from G Unit and D12 and the single Rich Girl by singer Gwen Stefani and rapper Eve. Forbes estimated his net worth at $270 million US dollars in 2012. The same publication later reported they acquired 110 million US dollars via his various endeavors in 2012, making him the highest paid artist of the year. Income from the 2014 sale of Beats to Apple, contributing to what Forbes termed the biggest single year payday of any musician in history, made Dr. Dre the world's richest musical performer of 2015. On April 4, 2016, TMZ and the New York Daily News reported that Suge Knight had accused Dre in the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department of a kill-for-hire plot in the 2014 shooting of Knight in Club One Oak. With world-class wreck and crew, with NWA, Dr. Dre has won six Grammy Awards. Three of them are for his production work. Thanks for watching. 
Don't forget like the video and don't forget to subscribe.